So now in this next video, we're going to continue our discussion on glucose homeostasis by entitling the next flowchart, Glucose Homeostasis 2. And what we want to focus on in this flowchart is the regulation of glucose within the entire body. Because again, this is a molecule that is utilized by every single cell that is living in order to drive its life, in order to drive its cellular processes. So glucose regulation is summarized in figure 41.21. It's a nice summative figure of what we're about to speak of. So glucose can be regulated in two situations if there's too much glucose or if there's too little glucose and the subsequent hormones that we've mentioned prior, the previous hormones, they're going to be utilized in order to combat both effects. So let's begin by looking at a situation in, it, in which we have high amount of glucose. But let's be a little more specific. Again, glucose is found within the blood. It's dissolved within the blood. And so let's take a look at high blood glucose level. Somebody who has a bl high blood glucose level is usually going to be uh, observed after a meal because a meal will contain carbs and different molecules. And basically, glucose will be the primary component of any meal, of any nutritional input. And therefore, the blood glucose levels will get higher after digestion and absorption into the blood. So what do we have here? What are the reactions of this situation to maintain homeostasis, to get back to the balance level? This is what we do first. First, we're going to call upon the beta cells. And those beta cells are again found in the pancreas, those islets of Langerhan, the pancreatic islets. These are endocrine cells. The beta cells in the pancreas therefore secrete um, a hormone called insulin. That's what their job is, and that's what they'll do if there's a high amount of glucose. That's the first step. Very important to remember this initial step. Now, insulin as a hormone is a chemical messenger. It has to have a target then. There has to always be a target tissue for every hormone that's secreted and released into the bloodstream. The target tissue in this situation is uniquely, actually, all cells. All cells within the body, except the brain. Except the brain. Now, we'll get to the exception in just a second, but let's just focus on this all cells. That's a big statement that I'm ha stating here, that insulin has the target tissue of every single cell except for brain cells. That's crazy to think, but it's logical for the following reason. Let's take a look at this pathway of insulin um, and its function. So insulin is going to be a molecule dissolved within the, it's within the bloodstream, and so it's hopping on that bloodstream highway going to literally every single cell. And insulin as a hormone, it's going to bind to the specific target receptor. And insulin, in this situation, binds to insulin receptors. Insulin receptors, that's the target receptor. It's a very specific binding lock and key um, on the cell plasma membrane. This is going to be found on every single cell. So that means every single cell has this encoded message of insulin to be transcribed and translated, the insulin receptor specifically. Therefore, insulin can bind to that receptor successfully so long as every cell is successfully making the receptor on its plasma membrane. Okay, big deal. Once we have this lock and key fit, we are going to have a reaction. The reaction will be cellular now because once insulin has fit onto its specific receptor, it directly stimulates the cells to take up glucose, to take in glucose. Because glucose as a molecule is kind of big. It's floating around um, outside of the cell and it's very difficult for it to just randomly, you know, sort of enter and diffuse into the cell. It actually has to have a forward message given to it by this insulin to insulin receptor binding. This causes the cell itself to state, okay, because insulin is here, it's time for me to take up all of this glucose that's in a really high level on all the blood that's surrounding me and going by me. Let me take in some of it. So this, this stimulates the cells to take up glucose from the blood. Again, why is it from the blood? Well, that's because the blood has high blood glucose levels. This then results in glucose coming inside the cell. Once the blood glucose is inside the cell, it's no longer blood glucose, it's cellular glucose. That means it's gonna be used for cellular processes. Those will include things like fuel. It's used as fuel to drive what process? Cell respiration, right? Or it may even be depending on the location, if it's maybe if it's in the muscle or if it's in the liver, it could be stored as glycogen as well. 
Overall, you've gone from blood glucose to cellular glucose. You're taking glucose out of the blood and into the cells for whatever reason that needs to, it needs to be used for. So therefore, the end result of all this is that you originally have a high blood glucose level. Now you have blood, the glucose within the blood at a lower level. You basically evened it out. You've created a balance. So now you have reached glucose homeostasis because now the cells have the glucose they need and the blood has less glucose you now have a nice even balanced level now let's take a look at this exception one really quickly if we have the brain as the only place that's not going to be targeted by insulin does that mean the brain doesn't use glucose no it actually doesn't it actually means quite the opposite this is a fascinating thing to me to think that the brain itself it actually takes in glucose it takes in glucose, it highly prefers glucose as its energy source, it's very picky, it really loves glucose without any insulin message. It does it by itself, the brain cells themselves are going to take in glucose without insulin ever needing to bind. This makes sense. It makes absolute perfect sense because it tells you that the brain, as a very active organ, it's a very active structure, needs access needs unlimited access, needs primary access, first dibs, to energy in the form of glucose at all times. It cannot wait for insulin to be secreted and reach the brain. It just needs to always have this opening for glucose to enter whenever it needs it, and that's what happens within the brain. Therefore, insulin doesn't even need to act on the brain. The brain can do it on its own. So that's the high blood glucose level situation. Let's flip that and let's say we have a low blood glucose level okay so we have low blood glucose levels now why are we always referring to blood glucose because that's where glucose will be put into after it's ingested digested and absorbed and put into the blood now there's a low amount of blood glucose when would you expect this after a meal or before a meal Without a meal, right? Before a meal, when somebody's not eating something, this is going to be the situation in which they'll have a low blood glucose level because there is no glucose within the consumption of this organism. So now what are we going to activate? Not the beta cells anymore. Now we activate the alpha cells. The alpha cells, also located within the pancreas, those islets of Langerhans, will secrete their specific molecule, their specific hormone, called glucagon. Again, antagonistic function to insulin. The absolute opposite, that's why it's in the opposite scenario. High versus low. So the antagonist of insulin called glucagon will be released. Glucagon has a actually very specific target tissue. So we already have a major difference. The target tissue here is going to specifically be the liver, not every cell. Okay, so it's the liver, not, not the whole body, not every cell has the specific glucagon receptor necessary for glucagon to do its job. Only the target tissue, the liver cells, have glucagon receptors, therefore glucagon only acts on the liver. Now, once it acts on the liver, what's the job of the liver? What's the liver cells going to do? Once glucagon has been sort of fit to the, its lock and key scenario, we have the liver cells do a job. Liver cells store what? They store glycogen. Glycogen is just a bunch of glucose put into a storage form. So now you get this message from glucagon. As a result of low blood glucose, what do you think you're going to do to all this stored glycogen? You're no longer going to store it. You're going to convert it. The liver cells get this message from glucagon to convert glycogen that's been originally stored for however long. That glycogen now has to be utilized. So the glycogen is going to be converted to its regular old form of glucose. Once it's converted into glucose, it's then secreted into the blood. Now, when you have glucose secreted into the blood, what do you think you've done to the low blood glucose levels originally? This overall, at the end of this whole process, you have effectively raised the blood glucose levels, raises blood glucose levels up until you reach a, st a status of glucose homeostasis. That's when you reach glucose homeostasis, when you get back to that normal range. Now, you were not in that normal range for the following reason. You didn't have any food, you were starving. So what your body did was take the stored glycogen, convert it to glucose, and uh, made sure that even though you're starving, in this, let's say a very hungry state, all your cells can still function successfully. Again, don't think of insulin and glucagon as two absolutely separate things. They very much 
antagonistically relate and talk back to each other constantly throughout the day, depending on the situation, depending on the individual and the type of food that they're consuming or lack of food that they're consuming. That covers our look at normal glucose regulation. The next logical step is to look at malfunction of this to see what happens if this is not correct. And it's very common, and we'll see what happens in the next flowchart.